What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're gonna talk about 10 beers or 10 brews, I guess, that you as a newer brewer should try to avoid. Um, recently, I put out a video on the opposite subject, 10 of the easiest beers that you can brew. The idea behind that video is that newer brewers could get some ideas put in their head and maybe a confidence boost um, about some various styles of beer that they might wanna try out. Now, on the opposite side, we're making this video. And please don't misinterpret the meaning of this video as you can't possibly make these beers until you're really good. That's not true. Uh, you can try these beers, and I do encourage you to go for it if you want to have a challenge as a brewer, um, because they are considerably more difficult than the easier ones that I mentioned a couple weeks ago. I'm just putting them on this list because I think if you prioritize these beers before building confidence in other beers and building skills in other easier kinds of beers to brew, you might be in for a bad time. Things can go wrong. They're much more likely to go wrong in more complicated beers. I'm gonna give the reasoning for why I think you should avoid them as I go through the list. So without further ado, let's go on to number one. Number one is anything that's over eight or 9% predicted ABV. These are like very strong beers. The reason why I think you should avoid these kinds of beers as a new brewer is because there's a lot of complicated fermentation things that are gonna be going on. You need to very, very carefully be sure that you have enough yeast, that you're pitching healthy, active yeast, that you are taking care of your fermentation, controlling your temperature very carefully, adding enough oxygen to the beer, and also making sure that you have the appropriate nutrients in the worts, and finally letting the beer condition long enough as well. It's a very complicated process, and oftentimes, because of these beers' higher original gravity, many systems actually struggle to either make a full-size batch of them or even hit those gravities due to efficiency losses. The second type of beer you should try to avoid as a new brewer is anything that calls for a very complicated mashing regimen. Any recipe that calls for a decoction mash, for example, or for a cereal mash, or for you know even a step mash in some cases can be complicated. Um, and you want to be sure you know what you're doing before you embark on that journey. Nowadays, it has been proven there are plenty of ways to make beers without those advanced mashing steps, although they do help in certain circumstances. So do ask yourself if you really truly need to do a decoction on your check lager or you really truly need to do a step mash on a Belgian beer. I can verify from personal experience, having done all of those things, it's not entirely necessary. Oftentimes, unless you're really trying to figure out how it works and get better at it yourself, adding in those complicated steps to the mash kind of opens up more chances for things to go wrong and it may not always be worth it. The third type of beer to avoid as a new brewer is the kind where you're adding stuff into the fermenter later. So for example, adding in, I don't know, like oak chips to mimic a barrel aged fermentation, something like that. Anytime you're opening up your fermenter or adding foreign objects to a fermentation, you are introducing a risk for oxidation and you're introducing a risk for infection. Depending on how well you control the environment for your fermentation based on either oxidation risks or sanitation risks, this may go different ways for you. Keep in mind also that some of these things that you add to the fermenter can behave in drastically different ways than you might expect. Um, cacao nibs is my favorite example of this. A lot of folks think that it brings in a nice chocolate flavor, and it does bring in a chocolate flavor, but it also adds a significant amount of bitterness. You wanna make sure you're doing research on whatever you're putting into that fermenter and not just blindly following a recipe. The fourth kind of beer to avoid is anything that requires a really long aging time, either in the fermenter or in bottles. My go-to example for this type of thing is a barley wine, uh, and this kind of falls again under that high ABV rule. Uh, you could brew one that's relatively drinkable, doesn't taste like jet fuel, uh, and have it ready in about two weeks, but if you really want this beer to be truly what it's meant to be, uh, which is an exciting and delicious high, high alcohol beer, you're gonna need to let it sit in the bottles, preferably for about a year. Uh, you're gonna need it to age for a long, long time to let that alcohol sting wear off and let those nuanced flavors come out that really make it what it is. You're really never gonna be able to come close to replicating your favorite high alcohol kind of beer without giving it a proper aging time. And the reason why I think that you should avoid this as a new brewer is you might be disappointed. The brew may not go as planned and the age may not be able to fix it um, if that's the case. I don't want you guys to be waiting six, eight, 12 months or longer to wait for this beer to open up and then be disappointed when you do crack into it. I'd rather you guys use that time to build your skills and develop more confidence in brewing um, using fermentations that don't take as long, beers that don't require as long of an aging period so that you can get more cycles in uh, and you can learn more in that process. And then when you've built that confidence up and you have the skills required, then tackle those high ABV, 
long-term aging projects. And then a year later when you open up a bottle, you will be very happy with how that turns out. The fifth type of beer to avoid is any sort of traditional sour or traditional wild fermented ale. Um, so when I mean traditional sour, I mean pitching lactobacillus or any other kind of bacterial blend and fermenting it that way, or wild fermented using regular Brett yeast. This is in contrast with other types of brewing sour beers like kettle sours or just simply using um, Philly sour or sour vizier, something like that that produces its own lactic acid. Those are much easier and less risky ways of brewing sour beers. I would definitely avoid brewing wild fermented beers until you're really very certain uh, and sure of your sanitation and able to segregate your equipment from your other beers. The reason to avoid some of these is just because of that sanitation risk. The worst thing in the world is having a contaminated part in your brew house that ends up infecting a beer that otherwise wasn't supposed to be uh, infected. It's a hard thing to have happen, but if you don't have proper sanitation practices, it can happen. The one thing that is extremely easy to have that happen with though is Britannomyces. Brett yeast is a notoriously persistent strain and you really do have to be very careful that you're thoroughly sanitizing, disinfecting, probably boiling if you can, any equipment that has been used with the Britannomyces fermentation. It can and will get into rubber, plastic, and other types of things and it's very tough to remove. So I would highly recommend keeping everything sanitary and segregated if possible when you're brewing these beers. If you don't have the equipment set up for it yet, you're not ready to take on that type of fermentation, I would wait until later before you do that. The fifth type of thing to avoid is alternative grain beers. Unless you're gluten intolerant and you're brewing for yourself out of necessity, you know, with an alternative grain like sorghum or something else that's gluten free, I would really not recommend playing around with alternative grains until you've built up a lot more experience brewing with straight up barley. Build up your skills and find the nuances of working with things like wheat, oats, rye, stuff like that that's similar to barley but behaves a little bit differently. Um, and then play around with some adjuncts like corn and rice and that sort of thing. Try that out before you start working with some of the alternative grains that are much more difficult uh, and play very differently and deliver a lot of different flavors. This includes other types of alternative fermentables like potatoes, pumpkins, squash, stuff like that. Again, if you want to experiment, then more power to you, um, but I don't recommend trying it out right off the bat until you've built up a bit more experience. The seventh type of beer to avoid as a new brewer is traditional lagers. What I mean is a lager that has been fermented with traditional lager yeast at a cold temperature for a long time, packed away and traditionally lagered for months and months until it's finally ready. While that is a perfectly okay way of making a lager, it's a very complicated one, requires good temperature control and lots of space and equipment in order to pull it off. There are much easier ways of achieving the same kind of beer nowadays. You can do pressure fermentation for a relatively low entry level price. You can also utilize different yeasts to get the same effects. Things like the Weinsteffen 3470 strain, which can ferment much higher, and uh, the Lutra Kvike strain, of course, as well, which is a very neutral, clean fermenter, very similar to lagers. All of these things can help you get a lager much faster. And this really does go back around to the point I made earlier about trying to avoid beers that are going to take a long time to be ready. I'm not saying don't make lagers at all. Lagers are actually really not that hard. Um, but I would recommend avoiding the traditional method until you really have the equipment and know that that's what you want to do. The eighth kind of beer that I would recommend avoiding is Trappist style ales until you really know what you're doing with fermentation. Um, Trappist beers are amazing. They are the reason why I got into craft beer. They're the reason why I got into brewing and it was some of the first beers that I tried to make in my entire brewing journey. Um, and they were never very good. The reason why I recommend avoiding them is not because you're not going to get a good beer out of it. I guarantee you'll probably get a drinkable beer that's decent. Um, but these beers are really something that benefits from age, they're strong beers, and they really do need a very special kind of attention to the fermentation. There's a really complicated cold side regimen to these beers. I mean, you have a, a very wild and intense fermentation at the very beginning. Uh, it can get very hot and the beer will go probably up into the 80s when you do this, if you do it properly. And then you need to condition it for a little bit of time at around 68 or 65. You can soft crash it if you want to. You have to let it condition and clarify and then you've got to carbonate it up to a very high degree, which requires very careful calculations in bottle conditioning. 
um, or you know direct CO2 injection from a keg is, is another option. But if you want these beers to really be the best they possibly can, then you really should try to avoid these until you're really building up a lot more skill. As I've said multiple times in this video though, I'm not actually saying don't brew these beers. I'm just saying be prepared if you want to make one of these beers for a much more difficult experience. And I would recommend waiting until later uh, when you've built up more skill to try these out. We're gonna cover two more beers, but these are not as generic. These are very specific recommendations to avoid. The first is Imperial Stout. Imperial Stout is one of the most difficult beers to brew. Uh, just from a number of reasons, you have usually a huge OG, you're gonna have a huge final gravity, you gotta pitch a ton of yeast, you have to balance extremely intense uh, flavor characteristics, lots of hops, lots of roasted malts, potentially things that are added into the fermenter like coffee and chocolates and uh, other kinds of uh, you know additions, sometimes lactose, depending on what kind of imperial stout you're going for. There's a number of reasons why these are incredibly complicated beers and I think are among the most difficult to brew. Um, and they're also coincidentally some of the most popular ones that people want to try out for the first time when they start brewing. And because of that, I think a lot of people get very disappointed when they try these beers and they end up tasting like jet fuel um, or are extraordinarily bitter um, or too roasty for them. And I think they get discouraged. And I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to look at that as a potential end goal, uh, something that you can brew one of these days and feel really good about yourself and you nail it. I highly encourage you not to try it out as a beginner and wait later. Don't be disappointed. Don't get out of this hobby because you made a bad Imperial Stout, seriously. There are many, many other beers you can make that are similar. Try a porter and then work your way up to the Imperial Stout. There's a lot of brewers that start out this hobby. They pick beers like that and they end up being sorely disappointed and think that they're never gonna be able to brew. And I think that's the furthest thing from the truth. It's absolutely a challenge beer and you should try to make them at some point, um, but just don't start out with them. That's all I'm saying. And the final beer that you should avoid is going to ruffle so many feathers. <laughs> I'm gonna piss so many people off when I say this, but it's true. And that is Hazy IPA. So it's like the most popular beer style out there right now for craft beer and it's the one that everyone wants to brew. And you can make a decent one, you can, but it's so, so easy to oxidize these beers and it's so easy to brew one that's just bad. And if you're looking at this hobby like, oh, I can make my own treehouse beer at home, it's not gonna work the same way. You're gonna be disappointed and I don't want you to leave the hobby because you're not able to make a perfect New England IPA in your first couple tries. There's a ton of moving parts with hazy IPAs. From the oxidation risks to the multiple dry hops to the whirlpool to, just so many different factors that go into making a good one or even just making one that's even shelf stable in the first place uh, that you really should learn how to make regular IPAs, regular pale ales, stuff like that first before you go on this journey. If you want to brew a good hazy IPA, start out with a hazy pale ale. It's not hard to make a hazy beer. And honestly, it's not hard to dry hop when you're dry hopping early in the fermentation. Most of the time, if you add a ton of hops to your whirlpool and you do a single stage dry hop during the primary fermentation, during the high frozen, you can get away with making a pretty good hazy IPA that's um, gonna probably be shelf stable and add a little bit of ascorbic acid in, add, uh, be sure you're transferring under pressure and you should be all right. It gets infinitely more complicated if you're doing like a double dry hop or you're trying to crank the uh, ABV up to like double hazy IPA levels. Um, and that's where things can start to fall apart. Like I said in my last video though, they're complicated beers and they're tough. There's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts, but just do it several times over and you'll start to really pick up on it. You'll start to understand what you need to do and then you'll be able to really reliably and consistently make good hazies. And with that, I wish you guys luck, I really do. Beer and brewing can be as complicated or as easy as you want it to be, really. It depends on what you're brewing and um, how much you really care about making the perfect product. If you don't care about you know, having a, the best possible IPA that you can make, then just go for it anyway. Um, there's nothing stopping you. I just highly recommend that newer brewers take the time and the effort to brew much easier beers first. Understand how the process works and then slowly add on complexity. Start doing a step mash, start playing around with closed transfers, start playing around with double dry hops if you want to, stuff like that. Add a few things into your fermenters, slowly increase the complexity over time to build that confidence and then you'll fully understand what you need to. And by the time you've done all that, you will be a veteran brewer. You'll know exactly what you're doing and you'll start making some outstanding 
outstanding beers, and you'll be very happy that you did. So regardless of your level, I encourage you to challenge yourself, try new things, but be sure that you're prepared to take on that challenge when you do, and I hope it goes well for you. So I, hopefully this video was helpful, and I hope you learned something. If you did, please go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Comment down below, those advanced brewers out there, what are the most difficult beers that you think people should try to avoid when they're first starting out? Let me know in the comments down below. If you want to support the channel, there's a number of different ways to do so. Uh, the one I recommend is picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find this in my merchandise store, which is linked down in the description box. Uh, other ways to support the channel, I also have a Patreon, uh, which has been hugely helpful for upgrading my production quality over the last several years. Uh, you guys are awesome, and um, I owe all of the production upgrades to you guys, so thank you. I also have channel memberships if you want to check that out for some perks, as well as uh, the super thanks button if you feel inclined to hit that, I appreciate that as well. I have an Amazon store down in the description box where you can find uh, all of the filming equipment that I use for YouTube, as well as all of the brewing equipment that I use on the regular and thoroughly recommend. I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check that out for some more frequent content updates. And uh, yeah, last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. I appreciate it. And um, I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers. This is an 8% Duvel, so I'm not gonna chug that.